poem from Greece, from the Cyclades, from the island of Caia. Moving over millennia. My feet move over millennia of men's sandaled footsteps on these dromas, rising and falling with the terrain just as they rose and fell on cool marble underfoot, walking under hours of sun, over marble and dry earth scattered with acorn shells, between stone-stacked walls and olive groves, through curtains of cicadas, wind, breath, sometimes with glimpses of celadon and cerulean, oases of sea. My feet move with mindfulness over their millennia. Kalispera, kalos orisete, good evening and welcome everyone and thank you for choosing to lean in to this 33rd floating poetry broadcast in our weekly series coming to you live from the blue and gold coast of New England from Watch Hill, Rhode Island, by the sea, the mythical sea. This is your poet and poetorialist Colin Goetheke with a glass of ouzo in hand for the occasion, inviting you each and all this week to travel with me to Greece, especially to the Aegean and the Cyclades, and the island of Caia, Chaos, where I spent remarkable times that wildly stirred the senses, the heart, the soul, the taste buds, the imagination, in its own way, a microcosm of a larger Greek macrocosm of experience that I invite you to to enter with me. As with last week's Buon Viaggio through Italy, Italia, and things Italian, I thought we'd have another swirl, a delightful, I hope meaningful, and at points visceral swirl, now to this other and truly mythical place. I brought together various soundings, outer and inner sensings, serenadings of the country and the culture, from antiquity to now, from its food to its words, wisdoms, and customs, and of course, a medley of poetry. Pammi, let's go to Greece, country of mythic proportions. Yes, a mythical place that lived luminously in my imagination until I was in my early 50s that came alive in books and poems and travel stories and conversations through my adult life, and later through a Greek soul brother of long standing I had, who had been inviting me to his treasured spot in the Cyclades for years and years until finally, one day, it was clearly high time to go, intuitive time to go, two summers in a row as it turned out. And I went to the mountainous island of Caia, Chaos, off the mainland from the port of Lavrion, in the Cyclades, a chain that stretches, as some of you may know, out to Santorini, Mykonos, and beyond. Serendipitously, or synchronistically, or both, this island, mainly visited by Greek boaters, was the ancient home of two of Greece's most famous ancient poets, Bacalides and Simonides, the latter name shared with my host and ancestor. Ancient poets whose footsteps I walked in there, literally, which inspired the opening poem you just heard, the music composed, by the way, by a very gifted collaborator, Jacob Friedman, who scored a handful of my poems and several I contributed to the America's Cup races in Bermuda in 2017 and to the Olympics 
the Winter Games in South Korea in 2018 and actually engaged to whenever they may be resuming the uh, the next Olympic Games in uh, Tokyo, which were rescheduled from the summer to maybe 2021. We'll see. Through the Truce Foundation of the United States, where some of you know I've gladly served and serve as Poet Laureate and have for the last number of years. So, a figli, friends, let's touch and taste and listen and look and feel in to Greece, to the Grecosphere, and where, for that span, and to um, uh, to my host of that uh, time and place, I it was no longer Colin, but Kolinaki. Um, I do want you to know, interestingly enough, because I was curious about this, and it happens that etymologically the word poet comes from the Greek. Uh, poets are makers, literally. You cannot carry anything in a poem. You cannot use it to store books or shoes or paper clips. You cannot use a poem as a cutting board or as a mode of transportation. A poem will not protect you from a draft, will not take dictation, nor will it protect your eyes and bright sun. A poem cannot keep you warm, and you cannot use it to trim your hair. A poem is hardly a thing at all. This is, by the way, from the Merriam-Webster um, site. Kind of fun. Except, of course, that it is, as the millennia of poetry prove, and etymologically, a poet is a maker. The word poet, which has been in use in English for more than 600 years, came from the Greek word pites, itself from potin, meaning to make. The word also shares an ancestor with the Sanskrit word sinoti, meaning he gathers, heaps up. But it is the word poet that has been most often tasked with referring to the person who writes poetry, who makes something that is unmistakably a thing, despite that thing being what Thomas Babington Macaulay called, quote, an illusion on the imagination. Shakespeare put the same notion in verse in A Midsummer Night's Dream. The poet's eye, in a fine frenzy rolling, doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. And as imagination bodies forth, the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. So I felt we might want to mention um, Sappho uh, and honor Sappho, among other things Greek, because um, she was quite amazing in her time. Little is known with certainty about the, her life, uh, she was born probably about 620 BCE to an aristocratic family on the island of Lesbos during the great cultural flowering, flowering in that area. In antiquity, she was regularly counted among the greatest of poets and was often referred to as the poetess, just as Homer was called the poet. Plato hailed her as, quote, the tenth muse, and she was honored on coins and with civic statuary. Apart from her fascination with the theme of love, Sappho contributed in other ways to the conventions of the lyric genre, her emphasis on emotion, on subjective experience, and on the individual marks, a stark contrast between her work and the epic liturgical or dramatic poetry of the period. But most of her work is intimate and private, addressed to specific women or to her friends, and her tone of colloquial familiarity anticipates medieval and modern practice, just as the troubadours recorded the names of friends and enemies with meticulous precision. And modern poets often insist on the paradoxical importance of ephemera. Her texts assume an immediate net of circumstance and imply that only through the particular can the universal be mentioned. Uh, sorry, be manifested. So, a bow to her. D.H. Lawrence wrote, apropos of that, so it is with poetry. Poetry is, as a rule, either the voice of the far future, exquisite and ethereal, or it is the voice of the past, rich, magnificent. When the Greeks heard the Iliad and the Odyssey, they heard their own past calling in their hearts. As men far inland sometimes hear the sea and fall weak with powerful, wonderful regret, nostalgia, or else their own future rippled its time beats through their blood as they followed the painful, glamorous progress of the Ithacan. This was Homer to the Greeks, 
their past, splendid with battles won and death achieved, and their future, the magic wandering of Ulysses through the unknown. With us it is the same. Our birds sing on the horizons. They sing out of the blue beyond us, or out of the quenched night. They sing at dawn and sunset. Only the poor, shrill, tame canaries whistle while we talk. The wild birds begin before we are awake, or as we drop into dimness out of waking. Our poets sit by the gateways, some by the east, some by the west. As we arrive and as we go out, our hearts surge with response. But whilst we are in the midst of life, we do not hear them. So if we talk of a great poet of antiquity, there are, of course, the gods and Apollo, not least, who is the Olympian god of the sun and light, music and poetry, healing and plagues, prophecy and knowledge, order and beauty, archery and agriculture, an embodiment of the Hellenic ideal of kolokagathia. He is harmony, reason, and moderation personified, a perfect blend of physical superiority and moral virtue, a complex deity who turns up in art and literature possibly as often as Zeus himself. He is the only major god who appears with the same name in both Greek and Roman mythology. And when I thought of Apollo, I thought of the superb Rilke poem, um, which you may or may not know, but you will now because it's the archaic torso of Apollo that Rilke wrote back in time. We cannot know his legendary head with eyes like ripening fruit, and yet his torso is still suffused with brilliance from inside, like a lamp in which his gaze, now turned to low, gleams in all its power. Otherwise the curved breast could not dazzle you so, nor could a smile run through the placid hips and thighs to that dark center where procreation flared. Otherwise this stone would seem defaced beneath the translucent cascade of the shoulders and would not glisten like a wild beast's fur, would not, from all the borders of itself, burst like a star, for here there is no place that does not see you. You must change your life. Well, thank you, Rilke, and speaking of Apollo and the Olympian gods, from Zeus to Poseidon, Demeter, Athena, Aphrodite, Artemis, Persephone, Dionysus, and the rest. This poem of mine, um, written on Kea, as these others will hear tonight of mine are, were, still live in me, uh, the satyr and the sea god. They disport themselves in a lucent blue disc of Aegean, ringed by mauve, rose, and ochre stone, pale ribbons of road, rises of oros, clouds of timari, sage, thrumbi. The satyr suns himself recumbently, hedonistically, on a dry tongue of rock above the glinting surface, his body a study in earthly unrestraint, sensuous, voluptuous, whisperous, wayward. The sea god floats languidly, nakedly in the prisming shallows by the shore, his body a movement of bronze and marble, white, white loins bathed in salt water, Honey brown torso and brown limbs oiled under seawater. Satyr and the sea god. So Homer, the great um, writer, poet of the Iliad, the Odyssey, um, as a poet I was intrigued with his reference uh, to the wine dark sea, very famous reference, um, uh, an epithet of uncertain meaning. Uh, uh, it turns out a, a literal translation is wine face sea or wine faced wine eyed. It's, it's attested five times in the Iliad and 12 in the Odyssey, often to describe a rough, stormy sea. Well, he's not alone in, in his unusual descriptions of color. Cicero says that the sea turns purple when oars strike it. The Bible mentions a, quote, red horse, not far from Homer's red oxen, while honey is described using variations of green in both these texts. Most importantly, many of the world's most ancient languages lack a word for, quote, blue. And Homer's problem seems prevalent in texts ranging from the Indian Vedas to the Icelandic sagas. 
Even in modern times, tribal societies whose language appears to have changed little over time also lack a word for blue. The most common explanation of this is that while Greeks of his day could distinguish between the colors of dark red and blue, they did not have words to describe the difference. How about that? That was an interesting little riff. I just threw that in for us. Um, apropos of odysseys, I had read this in another program where it was apropos, but couldn't uh, help but want to include it, um, inspired by Homer's Odyssey and how the essence, in a way, I feel applies to our lives and certainly to the shared odyssey we're all on right now. It's called Our, our Odysseys. No fingerprints of any two Odysseuses alike, each of us with our own epic to live and tell, our own Ithacas to seek, to journey to, our own wanderings and concealments, friendships and testings, omens, demons, passions, questions to contend with along the wild, unknown way, touched at times by the graces, sometimes caprices of greater and lesser gods of the singular lands and seas we wind up traveling, traversing. All the joyful and painful passages, encounters, vantages, offering each of us one-of-a-kind chances and choices, egoic to heroic, to see, to take, to make at every turn. You know, Kavafi, I'd read one of his poems another time, the most probably most famous, Ithaca, incredible poem, worth reading if you haven't yet or hearing. And he was a fabled modern poet. He didn't write a great body of work, but a lot of it stands out in the test of time. And Constantine Kavafi, um, among his well-held poems, I thought this on, an, on the same basis might speak to our times in a way. It's, it's his poem, Waiting for the Barbarians, and this is translated by Edmund Keeley, one of his great translators, Edmund Keeley. Waiting for the Barbarians. What are we waiting for? Assembled in the forum? The barbarians are due here today. Why isn't anything going on in the Senate? Why are the senators sitting there without legislating? Because the barbarians are coming today. What's the point of senators making laws now? Once the barbarians are here, they'll do the legislating. Why did our emperor get up so early? And why is he sitting enthroned at the city's main gate, in state wearing the crown? Because the barbarians are coming today, and the emperor's waiting to receive their leader. He's even got a scroll to give him, loaded with titles with imposing names. Why have our two consuls and practors come out today wearing their embroidered, their scarlet togas? Why have they put on bracelets with so many amethysts, rings sparkling with magnificent emeralds? Why are they carrying elegant canes beautifully worked in silver and gold? Because the barbarians are coming today and things like that dazzle the barbarians. Why don't our distinguished orators turn up as usual to make their speeches say what they have to say? Because the barbarians are coming today and they're bored by rhetoric and public speaking. Why this sudden bewilderment, this confusion? How serious people's faces have become. Why are the streets and squares emptying so rapidly? everyone going home lost in thought. Because night has fallen and the barbarians haven't come, and some of our men just in from the border say there are no barbarians any longer. Now, what's going to happen to us without barbarians? Those people were a kind of solution. Thank you, Kavafi. Um, this poem next poem I chose to include uh, was a lead piece from the poetry I made as a cultural contribution to the 2018 International Winter Olympics as Poet Laureate of the Truth Foundation that I'd mentioned earlier, um, because the Olympics and its spirit uh, is a great enduring gift from ancient Greece. And um, this is a bit of an honoring of that. And and a calling forth of that spirit itself, which we so need now, spirit of trucefulness. It's called peace ability. How the reverence for Echecaria, for this ancient Greek spirit from the days of Olympia and Elis, and the easeful, 
easeful holding of hands, unbearing of arms, transcends millennia to this moment of truthfulness, where Olympians and modern pilgrims travel and gather with ease of way into a higher place, one infused with peaceability, greater possibility. Put aside differences and didactics, enter the experience with an unspoken unity, a shared humanity. Greece gave us so many things like the Olympics. It certainly gave us uh, so many remarkable figures that, that include Alexander the Great, uh, who became king at the age of 20, united the Greek city-states, launched an expedition to the east, and conquered the Persian Empire all the way out into, to India. Died at 33. Alexander the Great. Homer, we've mentioned, um, of the Iliad and the Odyssey. They be, uh, historians believe that he was blind, uh, as shown by his name, which in Greek means he who can't see. Very interesting. Socrates, the enigmatic philosopher, founder of Western philosophy, his notions of ethics, virtue, and truth have passed through centuries. Uh, Plato, the metaphysic philosopher, student of Socrates, teacher of Aristotle, who introduced a new political system where philosophers as the holders of real truth and knowledge would rule. Aristotle, philosopher of reason. Hippocrates, the physician, most famous of ancient Greece, developed innovative theories and practices for his time, combined medical observation and philosophy to cure illnesses, believed that the human body had the power to heal itself. Archimedes, the mathematician, engineer, inventor, astronomer of the ancient world, of Leonardo da Vinci of his time, um, the painter El Greco, whose real name was Domenicus Theotokopoulos, who became famous as El Greco, which means the Greek. Uh, Maria Callas, the great opera singer, born in 1923 to Greek parents, um, performed at the Greek National Opera, moved to Italy, and performed at La Scala, and reached her peak in the 50s, some may remember her or of her. How about some quotes from these notables, some of them? Plato, one thing I know, that I know nothing. This is the source of my wisdom. Aristotle, good people do not need law to tell them to act responsibly, while bad people will find a way around the laws. Her Heraclitus, you don't develop courage by being happy in your relationships every day. You develop it by surviving difficult times and challenging adversity. And Socrates, there's nothing permanent except change. I was curious, as you may have been, of what a few notes on what it was like to live in an ancient Greek family. Well, there was a warm, dry climate, which it has today. Most people lived by farming, fishing, and trade, and others were soldiers, scholars, scientists, and artists. Ancient Greek homes were built around a courtyard or garden. The walls were often made from wood and mud bricks. They had small windows with no glass, but wooden shutters to keep out the hot sun. They didn't have much furniture. People sat on wooden chairs or, or stools. Um, rich people decorated the walls and floors with colorful tiles and paintings. Many homes didn't have a bathroom. There were public baths, but most people washed using a small bucket or in a nearby stream. Only rich women with slaves to carry the water enjoyed baths at home. Afterwards, they rubbed their bodies with perfumed oil to keep their skin soft. At night, they slept on beds stuffed with wool, feathers, or dry grass. Most went to bed as soon as it got dark. The only light came from flickering oil lamps and candles. Many walked around barefoot. Some wore leather sandals or, for horse riding, high boots. Both men and women wore wide-brimmed hats in hot weather to shade their faces from the sun. Suntans weren't cool in ancient Greece, so women put white lead on their face to make their skin pale. And we dial to Greek life today, and the one thing that jumped out at me, which I liked, was the, uh, the, the how socially spirited they are. Um, this is from um, a Lonely Planet's Greek Country Guide. Socializing is more than a pastime in Greece. It's a way of life. 
Cafes overflow with youngsters gossiping or older locals in heated debate. Restaurants are filled with long tables for big gatherings, and friends amble arm in arm down the street. Squares are the focal point, where life unfolds collectively. Immerse yourself, whether it's a coffee, a shot of ouzo, a chorus on the bazooki, or a local celebration. Greeks are passionate and live life to the fullest, even at the most difficult times. The result is a country seemingly riddled with challenges, yet full of people living and loving life. Well, I know that's probably not quite the story in Greece right now, or many places around the world, Europe and beyond. But um, that spirit, I hope, is, is kindling and burning regardless, and will come back out into full play in due course and for the rest of us. Um, I thought this was interesting about the Greek way of life that, um, also from Lonely Planet, that the uh, they pride themselves on their philotimo, a hard-to-translate concept that underpins the ent- all the cultural norms. It encompasses personal and family honor, respect and loyalty to parents and grandparents, sacrifice and help for friends and strangers alike, pride in country and heritage, and gratitude and hospitality. Though some would argue it has been eroded, the concept remains an important part of Greek identity. Something to learn from. Um, of course, food, you know, from the bounty of of, of their potpourri of culture. They've spun a captivating cuisine, says um, a Sever um, magazine, the Sever.com, C-V-E-U-R. Great weavers that they have always been, plating wool into tapestry, ideas into philosophy. The Greeks have done the same with their food, merging threads of influence from every area. It's simple and elegant with flavors subtle to robust, textures smooth to crunchy, fresh and timeless, nutritious and healthy. It's an adventurous journey into the cradle of civilization and the land of the gods of Olympus. Discovering, tasting, experiencing Greek food, truly, truly one of the joys we can all share. So if you haven't, you can. Uh, Spruceeats.com uh, shares with us um, Greece is a nation of small farmers who produce an incredibly, incredible array of mainly organically produced cheeses, oils, fruits, nuts, grains, legumes, and vegetables with an array of greens and uh, greens and herbs that grow in the wild form the base of the traditional Greek regimen. Climate perfect for growing olive and lemon trees. Spices, garlic, and other herbs such as oregano, basil, mint, thyme, widely used as are vegetables like eggplant and zucchini. And um, it's it certainly influenced many other cuisines and cultures. Um, and, but it's probably one of the mo- earliest fusion cuisines, tracing back to 350 BC. I was fascinated by that when Alexander the Great extended the empire's reach from Europe to India. Certain northern and eastern influences were absorbed into the Greek cuisine. Um, and with each successive invasion and settlement came culinary influences from the Romans, Venetians, Balkans, Turks, Slavs, and even the English. And many great foods have names with origins in those cultures most notably the Ottoman Empire. I thought one of the most fun facts was that the very first cookbook was written by the Greek food gourmet Archistratos in 330 BC. So we know cooking was very important, and I just thought we'd reel off some before we get to uh, everything else here, Uh, just names of some dishes that are lovely, like uh, karidopita, Greek walnut cake, a salada, Greek bean soup, garidis saganaki, Greek shrimp saganaki with feta cheese, gigantis plaki, baked giant beans, moussaka. Uh, tzatziki, of course, uh, termosalata, baklava, um, bugatsa, dolmadakia, stuffed grape leaves, um, and on and on. And um, uh, Greeks tend, as some of you know, especially if you are Greek, to show hospitality with drinks, often ouzo. I actually have some right here. Have a sip. Yeah, I'll keep the um, ouzo flowing. You, you don't drink it straight. Instead, you add ice or water, which turns it from clear to milky white. Um, now, if they want to go to the next level, the drink is tsipro. It's um, like, a, it's like, like grappa. It's the Greek grappa, brandy like fire water. Pretty strong. I've, I've had that. 
I'll take that lightly. So in, in honor of, um, of that um, experience of Uza, which I came to love by being in Greece, back in those times we've talked about, or I will talk more about, um, is this poem uh, composed on Kea in Galiscari, the Uzo hour, the hour when limbs loosen, eyes soften, anise, ice, and water alchemize, sun dissolves into saffron, chartreuse, the upper bodies of bathers become half gold, the lower half blue, moon phosphoresces, spirit floats, Conversation flirts, night coalesces, the Uzo hour. Before we dive more into the Cyclades and Kea and the poems tonight, today, here, a few um, amusing expressions I, I thought I'd share. The Greek doesn't say, I have no idea what's going on. She or he says, I've lost my eggs and baskets. Uh, Greek is not told to go jump in a lake. He is told to, quote, go see if the boats are moving. A Greek doesn't say something incomprehensible uh, like, it's all Greek to me. Instead, they say it's like you're speaking Chinese. <laughs> like that. So, the Aegean and the islands where we're entering... Um, if you know, if you've ever been to the Aegean, it's that embayment of the Mediterranean between the Greek and Anatolian peninsulas. It's very large, 215,000 square uh, kilometers. Um, and the Aegean Islands are located within the sea and some bound it on its southern periphery, including Crete and Rhodes. It's divided into different island groups, the Dodecanese, the Cyclades, the Sparades, the Saronic Islands in the North Aegean, as well as Crete. And the Cyclades is where we're going uh, right now, um, which refers to the islands forming a circle. The name in English means circular islands around the sacred island of Delos. According to Greek mythology, Poseidon, god of the sea, furious at the Cyclades nymphs, turned them into islands. And there, there are quite a few. Eos, Kimolos, Sikonos, Delos, Paros, Sieros, Milos, and where we're going, uh, Kea. And in the Aegean, the elements, the elements uh, are ever present and sensed, and especially the wind. By the way, there's a wild wind tonight where I am blowing. Um, very dramatic, very exciting. I hope open the door for a bit thinking we could have the wind um, effect, but it's, it's a bit too fierce tonight. So, but you might hear a little bit of it in the, in the, um, underneath all of our conversation tonight. So the Etesian winds, which are very powerful, are the Meltemi, M-E-L-T-E-M-I, the Meltemi. And this was an honoring of them as I experienced them, um, each of my summer, um, uh, Sojourns. They chap the indigo skin of the sea, flirt with women's hair and sailors' halyards, confound ferry captains, rush up and down ravines, cool the baking backs of bare mountains, refresh the faces of farmers in valleys, silent beekeepers, beachfront waiters, ruffle the ears of wild rabbits, the downy chests of roving pheasants, blow low and dry across the Aegean. Fan the islands north to south, and the undraped shoulders of a plein air poet passing time under the sun and solitude of Kea. On the way to Kea, um, to all the islands by ferry, pretty much um, the way to go. Um, my second summer, um, I and my wonderful host, arrived at the port in the middle of the night since my plane from London landed then and we slept a few hours in the little car we had and woke to take breakfast nearby and catch afterwards the first ferry over to Kea. And um, this poem um, came forth to me um, at Topio, the bakery, at the port of Lavrion. Hearth-warm circles of sesame bread greet our morning mouths. 
cinnamon-dusted cups of cappuccino, a crock of fresh white sheep's yogurt, salty and sweet. Honey, the innocence of the young woman making us at home, the table for two in the first slant of sun over the red-tiled rooftops near the waiting, soon carrying sea. The bakery. Know the deep set rhythms, the timelessness you can experience there that I experienced. Um, that is wonderful to experience in other places, of course, but I think especially there, perhaps because of because of the deep imprint of antiquity and mythology. Time unwinds on a cyclotic island afloat in the Aegean. Time unwinds, suspends. First and second hands move to untime to poet time, soul time. The rhythm of life reverts to a simple arc of sun, to expressions of light, progressions of shadow, to long-forgotten, now-remembered rhymes. The bounty of the land all around, all around. Um, this poem, Thano, bronze arms, opla, reach up to ripe, Figs, sika, pomegranates, rodia, and prickly pears, francosiskis, clustered among bright yellow blooms. Pluck warm almonds, amygdala, and fragrant lemons, limonia, all from giving branches, as bronze armed men and women in different dress have reached up through thousands of Aegean summers. You know, the custom, the Greek custom, certainly in the islands and elsewhere, but there of resting, of siesta, we could all benefit from that. And maybe we are doing that more and realizing how wonderful that is. I took one today, some up so early in the morning. I needed that to recharge myself for, for now, for being with you. And this is, um, they call that mesimeri, siesta mesimeri. Sun-caked white walls, cascades of bougainvillea, scents of sweet basil, jasmine, geranium that plume as you pass through the quiet hours. Sea blue shutters closed, stillness, even the cicadas slighter, the sleeping bodies of the islanders lighter, the passage of time slower. Missy Maddy. Um... And these islands and that island, for me, there there was so much sensuality in the air. It, it suffused you, your body, your reveries. It, it made you kind of drowsy in, 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 a, in an intoxicating way. And um, I lay one time at the place I was in at, under the um, grape arbor, overlooking the harbor, the arbor, above the harbor. Uh, and this is called Under the Arbor that indolence. Under the arbor, heavy with fruit, drowsy with late summer sun, eyes half open, limbs akimbo like the vines, ripe fruit clusters inside rose blush skin, inside dust purple skin, under the grape-leafed arbor. Even the figs there were provocative. There was a friend of my host who brought beautiful figs over from his garden. His name was Delio. And they were phenomenal just to look at. Um, you think about, let alone eat them. And this poem leapt into me. Stelio's figs, wild, erotic, and one yielding open to ripe color, sex, succulence. You know, there were so many interplays of of um, Greek sea and island light and tastes and sounds and scents and other savorings, other musings that often joined together and, as I said, played um, together and alchemized. And in uh, in Corisia and Kea, which is the uh, the main the harbor, um, came one of those experiences. Sitting as we did, making we cooked all the time and sat outside all the time and ate under the sun or the stars. And uh, this is called From Alpha to Apollo, and Alpha happens to be the name of the, the Greek beer, the local Greek beer. Cold Alpha, 
Fellini, Caruso, Di Stefano, Gavros with garlic, Ivor Novello, feta with oil, oregano, cicadas, ripe tomatoes, bread, olives, shadows, sun on brown terraced mountainsides. And then there are those transporting moments and traveling that we, some of us have had, maybe many of us will have again. Here's one of mine from then, from the, the beach at Pisces. Um, Pisces, tender caress of mildest air on sea-bathed skin, slow undress of verdant day, yellow tresses of sun falling over our faces, over mountain faces, orchards, temples, storied shores. This night a jeunesse of sunset stroking our eyes, brushing the mouth of the blue silver bay and the breadth of the ocean's shoulders with long fingers of aureolan, lemon, bismuth, and gamboge. For all of us um, color files, uh, as well as Greco files, that appeals. Uh, I traveled to Greece, by the way, at a pivotal time in my life, the uh, beginning of the end of a till then very beautiful marriage of decades, and this poem emerged there, and it's called, um, well, this is called, it refers to this, the Archaeon of Kea, Lion, 600 BC. The myth becomes reality. The reality becomes myth. Man is reconciled with the divinity. The prayers of Aristeus are heard by Zeus and Sirius. Instead of fear and terror, the Kaon, the great lion, inspires optimism for the beginning of a new life. The optimism is is imprinted on its smile, generously lit by the slanting sun. And at that time, um, as I was back from there and looking at some other poets who had written about Greek, Greece and the islands and their experiences, uh, was Joseph Stroud's poem, Crossing the Island, uh, it spoke so deep to the heart of my psyche uh, in the way that I was just telling you about the pivotal things that were going on. And this, he wrote on Carpathos um, back in time. Heat, heat, and the sky a flame of sapphire, an ocean of fire, even rocks blazing the earth, a rush of coals, Aegean summer, the air still, the day dead center in the sun, the world without breath. Even the goats drinking light all morning have descended to the shade of a cistern, while out there the blue of the ocean and the other blue of sky come together in that place where the gods descend to this world and enter the heavy honey of the body. And it was on this day when I set out into the core of light, wondering what it would bring, for I knew for once and for good my marriage was over. And henceforth there would be only these excursions into the sun, into the body, and the world would exact its praise of basil or goats, or the smell of thyme, and the resin, and the gold pitch of pine, and all the shelters of the spirit began crumbling within me. As I dismantled the man I was, learning to replace the old belief of Latin with the new tongue of this world, the tongue of rock and mountain and memory of the woman washing her hair on the terrace in the granite light as I went through the day to the other end of the island where the wedding guest had butchered a goat and roasted the meat over a fire in a noon so bright I couldn't see the flames as if sunlight were searing the flesh and the bride looked upon it all and found it to her liking, as the groom carved the meat, passed it around, and we ate of the world. And so it would continue. Thank you, Joseph Stroud. The house I was in in the harbor um, on that one arrival wasn't quite ready, and a friend of my host took us in for the day at her place till keys were arranged, and she, Maro, was an earth angel of a being. And this was a poem for her as a sort of a little triptych of a few glimpses of people that I came across that were memorable. And Maro, for Maria Ersi Colieri, 
you moved me to quiet tears with an unwordable gentleness of self, of spirit, high above the old terraced earth, above the light-bleached Aegean, as wine, sun, bread, waves of wind, poems, gestures, outer and inner voices touched and held us. I met a remarkable um, priest um, living in a monastery uh, almost in the middle of the sea, out on a spit, a little bit of land. Um, his name was Papa Lefteris. Happens to be, symbolically, his name was it stands for freedom, Father Freedom, uh, interestingly enough, who I met on one of my two summer sojourns on Kea. The priest is this piece for him, in honor of him, wherever he is. And there's a word, uh, two words in here, tsambuna, which is sort of, I guess you could think of sort of a bagpipe, a Greek bagpipe, and uh, kamalaukion, which is the um, uh, type of hat they wear. You've probably seen them in images, if not in person. The priest. He lives in a blue and white world, in summer and winter stillness, in the refuge of a mountaintop monastery, among pilgrims, icons, saints, seabirds, in the music of his sambuna, a benevolent being, from his life-wise eyes to his blossomed heart, under his black kamalakyan, ashen beard, long robe, and sandaled feet. Papa Lefteris, the priest, at the monastery of Panagia Castriani. Okay, uh, visit there if you go. Um, yeah, there were so many people, memorable moments of observing them and in their company sometimes, like these uh, gents, these three, the actor, the mayor, and the lottery seller I uh, dined with once on the harbor, over uzo, onion pie, cremidopida, octopus, calamari, a wavelet of yogurt with quince, three men from this island world, from this island earth, converse, eat, laugh, love at a simple table by the sea, by the moon, by the leave of unseen gods or graces. Okay, sip of uso. Just enough left to get to the, as we're coming toward the end of things for now. Uh, a poem to remember a supreme swimming spot is um, a spathi, the road to spathi. Bends and twists of ochres and blues, edges of thistle, wild thyme, cloud shadows over brush stubbled mountain faces as we slow motor through a high pass from the floating monastery of Panagia Castriani down to the clear to the bottom cove, Aspathi. Um, there were many mountain passes and they were pretty perilous and we had a little car and how we even came through alive is amazing because the drops were thousands of feet with no guardrails and certainly nothing paved, uh, which is a whole other story. You can ask me about another time or um, offline. Um, but, you know, antiquity and the lyric are, are, were everywhere here, even underfoot in the sea when I'd be um, swimming, um, wading. I'd, I'd reach down and pull up from the, the crystal blue water underfoot uh, uh, pieces of ancient sea-smooth marble. Fant I, I, I must have brought a hundred pounds of things home. Um, they were so beautiful at stones and uh, marble and other things. I carried on my shoulders um, back in the day, back in that day. The road to Kaliskia. The ochre earth road spools down, sails out, plunges into sapphire, into the swaying sea. Marble-strewn coves shelter solitary boats, sun-blown branches, slow-swimming bodies. A lyre wind plays gently, lyrically over the waters, over the wonders. Um, I was told that in its time... Um, that it was also known as Hidrusa, so it was a more arid island when I was there. There were there were some verdant parts, but uh, it at one point had been um, much more verdant. But it also had seven apparent sort of cities of some kind, and, and seven temples, one for each city, um, some reachable only by the water. Um, Carthea was one that I hiked to. Um, it was incredible and powerful, and Carthea... Sheer, wind-swept, sun-bleached, sea-swept, marbled, time-sown, templed. And on that long and lovely hike, which is in my second summer there, we, we took a picnic and later a nap in the shade and the lullaby of the waves. Um, 
picnic among the ruins. Dark green sunglasses, bleach white kerchief to shield the neck from high burning sun, butterflies, wild sage to mark and scent the way we descend down a steep, rough path to the re rising ruins of Carthea. For a picnic swim and mouthfuls of Retsina below the pillars that templed Apollo and Athena eons ago. And when I was there, standing on this one point, the, I, I heard a kind of a music there, certainly inner music, and arising in a poem at the same time, and music among the ruins. A solo flute floats upwind into our ears with the sound of waves smoothing over stones on the shore, with rushes of sea wind through the sun-baked, time-baked ruins, with the imagined voices of mythic gods and deep blue siren songs. So, as we wind out now, um, next to last, a poem toward the richness and aliveness of the landscape, the islandscape, and the distant past meeting the resonant present, and imagine future all at once converging. Zoe, life is this poem. I want to stand here in Anoxi, spring, when these slopes, stream banks, shaded gorges, crevices, and village streets are awash in wildflowers, when the landscape flows with fragrant herbs, orchids, and mosses, with juniper and pistachio, roses, corn flags, water flags, cactus and chestnut blooms, royal oaks, flows wild over the bed of raw, renewing earth, over the schists, the red and white veins of marble, the deep cords of limonite and hematite, and caches of long-buried coins whose dog-starred rays shine again after millennia. Zoe. And last for now, upon arriving, I had this moving moment of invocation, and I felt natural for us to end um, with this, and our time together in Greece with it. An invocation. Let the gods speak. Let the sea and wind gods speak to me, sing to me of their storms and serenities. Let the dry earth yield up its new and ancient fruits and flowers, its hidden waters. Let the clear air carry my own voice into these hills, into these stones, into this sea. If Haristo, thank you for listening in, for feeling in, and coming along for this jaunt, this taxidia thalassis, and also during this global odyssey, odyssey, which it is, paging Homer and Odysseus, Continued thanks for those helping to support these programs in poetic arts with donations and such genuine enthusiasms. Every note of appreciation you send me is welcome, and every contribution, which you can easily make by PayPal or Venmo or directly through my site, as are invitations to have me as an artist in residence going forward to create new work for a month or a season or sponsor part of an emerging art project. I also invite your thoughts and questions. Send me yours around this or an earlier broadcast. What inspired you? What would you like to hear more about? I'd like to answer them in a program, ideally before year end or in January. Email me at colin at thepoetorialist.com. Meanwhile, all the shows have replays and are shareable online. I invite you to lean in next week or soon again. Until then, dear listeners, good days ahead. Days of happiness. If to hear and good spirits, heritage.